this week on Waterways. Seagrass and Sanctuary Patrol. For many people around the globe, the Florida Keys stir up images of crystal clear waters, world-class fishing, and North America's largest living coral reef. Less well known is the seagrass community. Ironically, the seagrass ecosystem is directly responsible for South Florida's gin clear waters, commercial and recreational fishing, and the coral reef. Seagrasses are true flowering plants that live underwater. Florida has more than 2.6 million acres of seagrass, with Monroe County accounting for over half at 1.45 million acres. While approximately 52 species of marine saltwater seagrasses exist worldwide, only seven are found in Florida. The most common and largest of the key seagrasses is turtle grass, Thalassia testudinum. Turtle grass has a deeper root structure than any other seagrasses and forms extensive meadows throughout most of its range. Turtle grass leaves are flat and wide, about 4 to 12 millimeters, and the tips of the blades are rounded. The blades can extend between 10 and 25 centimeters in length. Shoots containing leaf blades are found growing from the underground stem of the turtle grass, called a rhizome. The turtle grass rhizomes form an extensive network buried just under the sediment between 5 and 10 centimeters deep. This extensive interconnecting network of rhizomes and roots make the turtle grass very stable and resistant to large storm activity. Another common seagrass in South Florida and the Keys is manatee grass, Syringodium filiforme. Manatee grass is unique among seagrass because of its round blade. The length of the blade is variable and can reach lengths of 50 centimeters or about 20 inches. The roots barely penetrate the substrate and manatee grass is commonly mixed with other seagrasses or in small patches. A third type of seagrass common in South Florida is shoal grass, Halidule righti. Shoal grass is an extremely important species of Monroe County because it is an early colonizer in areas with disturbed sediment. Shoal grass can often be found where turtle grass and manatee grass are unable to take root. The leaves are one to three centimeters wide, flat, and grow up to 20 centimeters high. Shoal grass is often in very shallow water and can withstand being exposed at low tide. A fourth and less common seagrass in the Keys is widgeon grass, Rupia maritima. This grass is considered fresh water but is adaptable to low salinity. Thus, widgeon grass is most abundant in Florida Bay near the mainland and other areas that receive freshwater runoff. The last three types of seagrass found in Florida are stargrass, paddlegrass, and Johnson seagrass. These grasses are sparse and not much is known about them. However, much is known about turtle grass, manatee grass, and shoal grass. Well, one thing that always amazes me about the seagrasses is they, they're always in the background, and, uh, but they're, they're an integral part of just about every area in the entire uh, sanctuary. Uh, you know, the recent study documented about 80% of, of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is carpeted in seagrass. 
This huge carpet of seagrass is a perfect habitat for marine creatures seeking shelter from predators and provides an almost endless food source. In fact, more than 70% of Florida's recreational and commercial fish, crustaceans, and shellfish spend part of their lives in shallow water estuaries among seagrass. Seagrass has played a very important role to, to marine life in the Keys uh, in the respect that um, many of the commercially and recreationally pursued species down here spend at least a portion of their life cycle uh, within seagrass beds. Um, you know, most, you know, most notably uh, stone crabs and lobsters and many of the snappers and groupers um, spend at least a portion of their life uh, within the seagrass bed. Uh, pink shrimp is also a very uh, important recreational and, and commercial, commercially pursued species that spend um, a great deal of their, their life cycle in seagrasses before they move offshore to the, to the uh, Tortugas shrimping grounds. The camouflage provided by the seagrass is so good that humans rarely catch a glimpse of its complex world. This may be one of the reasons public support of seagrass preservation has lagged behind other environmental efforts. Life abounds in seagrass. In addition to the many fish and crustaceans, sponges and corals thrive among healthy seagrass. And while seagrass blades are directly eaten by green turtles and manatees, many organisms eat the growth that live on the seagrass blades. Queen conch are very commonly feeding um, in seagrass habitat. Um, they're not actually eating the seagrass, but they're grazing the, the, small, the small animals that grow on the seagrass blades. So they're feeding on these small, these small epiphytes, and they're also feeding on the very, very fine uh, very fine algae that grows on the on the exterior of the seagrass blades. So those those offshore seagrass beds, the thalassia beds, um, play a very important role to queen conch. As thousands of creatures feast in seagrass beds underwater, the tides shift, and wading birds flock to the shallow water flats. It is here that herons, egrets. Ibis, and others stalk their seagrass prey. Even pelicans feed in seagrass beds, swooping from the sky, collecting schooling fish. Seagrasses are very important ecologically, not just from the habitat standpoint, but from the water clarity standpoint as well. And uh, keeping the sediments trapped uh, beneath their, their rhizome or their, their growth pattern that they, you know, that they exhibit. And once they colonize an area that is already somewhat slow moving and the blades begin to grow toward the sun, uh, then that actually slows down the water movement even more and so those particles will start to just get trapped between the grass blades and so the grass will begin to actually accumulate sediments over time. Without seagrass, the sediment is perpetually suspended in the water column, thus blocking sunlight from penetrating the water surface. Without sunlight, the seagrass will slowly die, 
sloughing off lifeless blades. These dead blades block more sunlight, creating a cascading effect, exponentially decreasing water clarity. In addition to trapping floating sediment, seagrasses stabilize the bottom with their roots and rhizomes, much the same way land grasses slow soil erosion. When a seagrass bed is destroyed, the silt on the seafloor can be stirred up and become sediment suspended in the water column. While the seagrasses themselves depend on clear water and sunlight, almost every creature in the ocean is either directly or indirectly affected by water clarity. Even corals are dependent upon sunlight. Living in coral tissues are photosynthetic algae. Without those plants, the corals bleach and could eventually die. Compounding the loss of sunlight caused by floating sediment is an increase in nutrients in water runoff from land. Sometimes, increased nutrient levels cause an overgrowth of the epiphytes living on the blades. That overgrowth can actually interfere with the plant's ability to make its own food by blocking the sunlight. The result can be very detrimental for the plants. Since 1950, Florida seagrass population has decreased from 5 million acres to just over 2 million acres, while the human population has increased from 2.7 million to over 16 million. We do have a problem from time to time with shoreline development because the grass, the grasses really do grow uh, relatively shallow right up against the shore. But of course, when you have you know, dredging operations or, uh, or docks being built, uh, that you know, disrupts the grass, uh, grass beds. Dredge and fill projects, construction of marinas, and the building of docks and bridges contribute to the damage to seagrass. Docks shade out seagrass so it cannot grow. As Florida has become more urbanized, thousands of acres of seagrass meadows have been lost. The loss of seagrass beds is gradual, but has a long-term impact on commercial and recreational interests in the Florida Keys. Adding to this planned destruction of seagrass beds, there are over 30,000 acres of seagrass with propeller scarring in South Florida. There is scarring on every seagrass bed. Boat propellers can rip up seagrass and dig trenches through seagrass meadows. These prop scars can eventually create barren areas where fish and other animals once flourished. Monroe County has the largest amount of damage to seagrasses from boat propellers of any county in Florida. The damage caused by a boat propeller in five seconds can take from two to 10 years to heal. Some scars may never heal, and in fact, many worsen over time. You know, a lot of boaters don't really realize how much damage they do by scarring up the bottom with, with their propeller. It's, it's an easy thing for, you know, for someone to make a mistake, but it's something that, you know, people really need to make an effort, and they need to be sure of the water depth that they're in, and they need to be sure of where, they're lo you know, where they are at all times. They need to have the, the right charts and the, the right equipment. Other than charts, a GPS, and a depth finder, the most important piece of equipment a boater can have to prevent running aground is a pair of polarized sunglasses. Polarized sunglasses will cut the glare from the water so the boater can more easily see the bottom. Just as you wouldn't take a small boat to the deep sea, one should never take a big boat into the flats. This past year, we had over 160 seagrass cases altogether that we actually prosecuted. So we're, we're talking about a lot of them. The seagrass is important. It's uh, as important a part of the, the coral reef ecosystem as the coral reef itself. The old idea is, uh, and we've had people tell us this, uh, you're more concerned about your weeds than you are my boat. And uh, the answer is, yeah, we are more concerned about our weeds. <laughs> it's an important part of the ecosystem. If you are driving a boat that runs aground, stop, 
trim your engines up and walk your boat to deeper water or wait for high tide to drift free. Do not attempt to get off a seagrass flat under power. This practice can cause extensive damage, creating large blowholes in the bottom. One reason why prop scars are so bad is we just have so many of them. I, you know, one prop scar might not seem like very much, but when you fly over the keys in a, in a you know, plane that goes relatively low, you can just see bank top after bank top uh, that has the problem of prop scarring where this begins to break up the integrity of that entire ecological community. If you thought of them as the ocean as a motorized system, the seagrass would be the engine that was keeping everything running. And they, the seagrasses pull it together. Just about every organism in some way or another uh, depends at some point on seagrasses. So they really constitute by area our number one habitat. And anybody who really cares about fishing and fisheries or even, you know, tropical fishing, tropical fish uh, would, you know, want to promote the, uh, anything that's going to make the seagrasses happy. Seagrass is alive. For this reason alone, it should be protected. In addition, our seagrass community supports scores of species of fish at various stages of their lives. Without healthy seagrass beds, these fish populations are compromised, as are commercial and recreational fishing, wading birds, clear waters, and the precious coral reefs. The Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary has adapted rules to preserve the delicate marine ecosystem. However, simply establishing rules is only part of the effort to re-establish fish populations and reef health. If the rules are to be effective, they must be enforced. Therefore, a special sanctuary patrol made up of state officers from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission helps protect the marine environment by ensuring that residents and visitors comply with sanctuary regulations. Um, it, it's a violation for a, uh, a trapper to put his traps inside a ecological reserve or a sanctuary preservation area, and they are marked by the yellow boundary buoys. Um, most of the fishermen are very good about um, keeping them outside. Um, once in a while, you do get a trap line that wanders inside. The yellow buoys mark the boundaries for ecological reserves and sanctuary preservation areas. These areas are called no-take zones and are restricted from fishing and laying lobster traps. Okay, what I'm doing is checking the trap line to see if they're inside the reserve. You're not allowed to, to lay fish traps or lobster traps rather inside the reserve. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull the line tight get it vertical in the water and get right over the trap and line up my line up my boundary buoys which are the yellow buoys to my right and my left and see if the trap is in fact inside the reserve uh, this trap happens to be right on the line so it's good I'm gonna go ahead and release it Sometimes storms and strong currents move the traps into the reserves. In these cases, the sanctuary staff allows the fishermen time to remove their traps from the no-take zone. The Sanctuary Marine Patrol is law enforcement similar to local and state police. However, their powers of enforcement slightly differ. On a traffic stop, an officer needs to observe a violation uh, in order to effect a stop. On a vessel boarding, an officer, in order to know if a violation has occurred, um, he needs to get aboard the vessel in reference to fisheries and boating safety. The sanctuary's goal is to have residents and visitors understand and comply with regulations, not to write tickets. So sanctuary officers use an approach called interpretive enforcement. 
seeking to educate the public before they harm sanctuary resources. Okay. Grunts. Bunch of grunts and a porgy. Grunts and a porgy. One big peach board. Okay. You guys got all the mothers run off. Oh, we did, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, do you have a uh, vessel registration? And does everybody on board have a fishing license? Breaking sanctuary rules results in a civil citation, like a traffic ticket. A summary settlement schedule lists fines for many infractions, simplifying enforcement. So keep that with you. Okay. And also, I just want to make sure you have your safety gear with you today. We have. Okay, I need to see four life, life jackets. One here, two on the seat. Okay, get your throw cushion, throw fire cushion. extinguisher. Yes. All right, I see that. Fire extinguisher right here. Okay. And uh, your flare kit and a sound producing device. Sanctuary officers also keep busy responding to more than 600 reported vessel groundings each year. When boats run aground in the Florida Keys, they often damage critical seagrass, hard bottom, or coral reef habitat. For smaller groundings, officers can issue a citation on the spot. But assessing the damage from larger groundings requires assistance from sanctuary biologists. I'm out here to enforce the regulations that have been put in place to protect the resource that the people are using. Um, and to those people that say that um, I'm a bad guy and I'm harassing them and issuing citations for making mistakes by catching undersized fish or being in the wrong area in the wrong place um, are missing the point. I'm out here to protect a resource that they're either making their living off of or just using recreationally for their enjoyment. Joe Scarpa and the other officers in the Sanctuary Patrol are serious about protecting the sanctuary. They take pride in ensuring that the rules to protect our fragile marine ecosystem are followed.